it going? Uh, 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 um, welcome to Stand Up at Cal's very first show in Berkeley history. Give it up for our performers tonight. This is our first show as a club. We are about uh, two semesters old, uh, not counting the Zoom semester. Ooh. Um, thank you so much for joining us in this fire hazard of an event tonight. Uh, can I have Exec come up and introduce ourselves? Um, my name is uh, my name is Aditya Bawal. I am one of the co-presidents of Stand Up at Cal. I'm Laura Hall. I'm the second co-president of Stand Up at Cal. I'm Ashley, and I'm the social media marketing person. <laughs> I'm a Jay Madala. I also don't know what I'm here for, so. <laughs> we also have uh, another exec member who couldn't make it here today. Her name is Saloni. Uh, I think I don't know what she's doing. She's probably working on her next Netflix special or something. <laughs> Um, thank you to Noah Kim for providing the mic and stand. We are a very new club, so we don't have too many resources, given that this is our second semester, we don't have too much money, but it's okay. Rome wasn't built in a day. It was built over the course of a few centuries which is about how long it takes for the ASUC to fund us. Um, we can't even afford a stool. Um, <laughs> that's not a joke, it's true. It's not. Um, water, that's, actually. True. That, that, that's um, why we have the Venmo. Uh, just a little uh, suggest just, just a support. Suggest a donation. Um, to get us hyped up for the show, when I point to this side of the room, I want you to yell, STAND! 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 And when I point to this side of the room, I want you to yell, UP! UP! STAND! STAND! UP! STAND! Louder! UP! STAND! UP! STAND! UP! At Cal, thank you everyone. On Instagram. So, without further ado, we are a bit limited on time. It's already 7.18 p.m. Uh, we have a brave soul who will be our very first ever performer tonight. Her name? Thank you. Give it up for Emily! Oh my gosh. Okay. Who here has heard of Forbes 30 Under 30? Forbes puts out a list of 30 incredibly accomplished under 30 year olds. And I always thought it was really interesting how your success could be capped at a certain age. Yeah, um, as if we as Berkeley students don't already feel enough pressure. Uh, I feel like I'm speaking to the right crowd here. Um, but I recently found out that Team Vogue comes out with a 21 under 21, filled with incredibly accomplished under 21 year olds, activists. Olympians, Sunni Lee is on there. I'm just like, when will this stop? <laughs> this age cap of our success. Soon Toys R Us is going to come out with a top five under five, with <laughs> newborns coming out with the most innovative ideas and technology. Speaking of technology, do I have any electric toothbrush users in this room? Okay, cool, a good amount of you. Yeah, I was recently talking to my um, housemate about electric toothbrushes and how we both use them, but we don't really understand if they really do that much. She was describing it, and she was saying that, uh, you know, you get your toothbrush out, you put toothpaste on it, you turn it on, you put it in your mouth, move it around a little bit, like up and down, side to side, makes a sound, you take it out, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't really know if it does that much. Um, and then I was like, damn, that's really synonymous with straight sex. Um, you know, you get it out, you turn it on, put it in, move it around a little bit after a couple minutes. You take it out, make the sound, take it out. And uh, I was like, damn. Um, and I also recently learned that birth control doesn't work if you have diarrhea. Because it just like comes out too quickly and your body can't process it. And it reminded me of this app that I used to use with my friends called Poop Maps. I don't know if you guys have heard of this app. But, oh yeah, we have some Poop Maps users in the room. Okay, either way, I'm gonna explain this to y'all. So essentially what Poop Maps is, is when you drop a shit, 
you drop a poop on the app. The app notifies your friends who are also on the app in real time. You can leave a little status update. You can say how it felt, the experience, what TikToks you were watching, what music you were listening to. You can even give it a rating out of five stars. You can even drop a picture. That is advanced, not for me, maybe for more advanced users of the app. But never in my life have I felt more connected with my friends. Seeing how, when they shit in real time. It really builds community, you know? <laughs> One day you're just like, hey man, I like realized you didn't post on Poop Mouse today. What's going on? Like, you want to talk about it? You want to get some coffee? Maybe some laxatives? Um, and I actually started using this app with my friend and her boyfriend at the time. And, and his friends. We were in a league together. So you can have leagues on this app too. And if you poop more, you rank higher up in the league. And it's all the honor code, honor code. And so we were all using it together, you know, building that community. And then they broke up. It was really sad because it was her first really serious relationship. And they were together for a really long time. It was long distance. And, you know, you do what you always do when you, you know, break up with someone. You uh, unfollow them on social media. You block their phone calls. And then she unadded him on Poop Mouse. And I was like, damn, this is serious. <laughs> and after about a month of them having broken up, they thought it was time for a closure talk. And they came together. And she was like, you know, I've been doing really good. I've been making new friends. I've been finding myself again. And he was, when it was her, his turn to talk, he was like, actually, I've been thinking a lot about you. Because um, I still see every time you shit on Poop Maps. <laughs> this boy didn't unadd her on Poop Maps. <laughs> Down back. <laughs> um, and I just felt like the story is really a reflection on how much Poop Maps can do for your emotions and your relationship. So much so that my friend one time when she was drunk, emailed Poop Maps asked me if they need ambassadors. They did not, but they did send her a 15% off discount to their merch, which she bought and wore around campus, this campus, and posted pictures promoting poop maps. Nice. I know. And uh, I was wondering, like, who are the people behind this, this revolutionary social media? And I did what any sane person would do. I searched up poop maps on LinkedIn. And lo and behold, Poop Maps founder and CEO, a Croatian man who coded this app when he was 20 years old. And as I was sitting there staring at this LinkedIn page of this Croatian man, taking in all that Poop Maps has done for my friendships and my community and my life, I was like this. This is a man who should be on Vogue 21 under 21. Thank you. Okay? <laughs> and the homeless man's like, 
I can make it work. As if he's the one doing the favor. <laughs> that happened my first day here. What a beautiful and wonderful and terrible and deeply flawed city we live in. Like, honestly, and the campus. I learn more about this place every single day. Like, uh, for example, who would have thought that the most annoying part about being a college student would be little pieces of paper. People giving out flyers on Sproul, yeah. Uh, but before I get into it, like, let me just say, like, I get it. Like, it's a thankless job. And I would know, uh, because I don't thank them at all. <laughs> Honestly, I find that the quickest way to get through them is to just agree with what they're saying, take what they're giving, and move on. Like, if I'm ever walking through Upper Sprout, the guy's like, Hi, are you interested in joining the business club? I'm like, why, yes, I am interested in joining the business club. Take the flyer, move on, done. I keep walking and the girl's like, hi, are you interested in auditioning for acapella? I'm like, well, yes, I would love to audition for acapella. Take the flyer, move on, done. It's exhausting. <laughs> By the time I get to the end, just like, are you a fascist capitalist that is also a racist? <laughs> <I'm> like, yes. <laughs> I'm a fascist capitalist. It's awesome. Dude, just give me your flyer. <laughs> Stand-up comedy is a lot like being the villain in a cartoon. Like, uh, oh, you should have seen me out there last night, I was killing! Like, either one of us could have said that sentence. And we love our captive audiences, like, none of you are going anywhere, Tom Douglas. <laughs> and your silence upsets us. Like, uh, no reaction to that one, huh? <laughs> How about this next one? <laughs> the main difference is when things go wrong. Like, when things go wrong for, like, a, like a cartoon villain that's just like, CURSE YOU PENNY THE PLATTABOS! <laughs> but, like, when things go wrong for me, it's a lot more of just staring at the floor in the shower, like, the hot water just coming down, shampooing my hair twice, because in my grief I can't remember whether I shampooed my hair or not already. <laughs> comedy! Let's talk about comedy. Honestly, comedy is all about the room. It really is. Stand-up comedy is all about the room. It's really easy if you understand the room and the people that you're working with. Like, if you're doing comedy uh, to, like, a room of, of men you want to kill, like, all you have to do is say, like, women, am I right? <laughs> and they're all like, oh. <laughs> And if you're in a room of women and you want to kill, you just go, like, ladies, men, am I right? And they're just like, oh, men. If you're in a room of gay people, you're just like, straight people, am I right? And they're like, oh, straight people are so weird! And when you're in a room of straight people, you're like, gay people, am I right? And they're like, oh. <laughs> Am I allowed to laugh? <laughs> I'll laugh if you laugh. <laughs> I'm not going down alone. <laughs> I got some thoughts about Bigfoot. <laughs> I think those TV shows uh, where they try and find Bigfoot are the only shows on the Discovery Channel where they don't discover anything. <laughs> like, what about a self-discovery channel? Like, like, there's a, like there's a guy who's just like, well, I didn't find Bigfoot, but I found myself. Is that he's like a good person now? <laughs> like honestly, like do the networks expect us to believe that they have discovered the legendary Bigfoot and the only way that they have chosen to communicate this to the academic community is via their Discovery Plus show. Like, imagine the two guys out there. Imagine, like, the two people making this TV show. Just like, oh my gosh. We found Bigfoot. What do we do now? Do we contact the press? The museum? And the other guy's just like, no. <laughs> Here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> First, we're gonna wait six months for the producers to edit the show and then ship it off to distribution. <laughs> then, we're gonna wait another two months for them to run the ad campaign. <laughs> then we're gonna wait a successive 12 weeks for them to run the episodes of the series, which results in a season finale that is, <laughs> that is preceded by a marathon of every episode before that. And then we go, shoot, he's gone! <laughs> Have you ever thought about what it's like to be a clam? 
<laughs> like you're just about. <laughs> you suck mud and spit water, you're born. You have dreams, you die in a bread bowl. <laughs> have you ever thought about what it's like to be a muscle? Like a clam, but worse. <laughs> Have you ever thought about what it's like to be an oyster? Like, you're a clam, but like, really big. <laughs> Have you ever thought about what it's like to be a scallop? Like, you're a clam, but like, you can swim, because you're a scallop. I'm glad we get out of this conversation. <laughs> Let's have another, shall we? I think it says something about my physical everything, when at night, girls will ask me if I need to be walked back to my dorm. <laughs> Like once I was at a party, and the host is like, hey guys, um, so uh, yeah, Jenny's gonna head home a little bit early, um, but you know, it's pretty dark and it's very late. Would someone be able to walk Jenny back to her apartment? And I'm like, hey, I can walk her back. And they say, <laughs> thanks, Noah. Hey, uh, would someone be able to walk Jenny and Noah back <laughs> to Jenny's apartment? Because <laughs> in case something actually happens, we need someone who can actually do something when it happens. Uh, like, we need like a, we need like a, like a, like a like, if you're into muscles, look somewhere else. Like, honestly, I have the perfect victim. I'm about five feet tall. When I get excited, my voice sounds like a small rodent. In the autumn, I'm just digging up nuts like a gosh darn chipmunk. In a previous life, my name was Alvin. Like, honestly, if Jenny and I were walking down the street and the guy came out with a knife, like, gah, and Jenny would be like, Noah, do something, my only instinct would be to go, Christmas, Christmas time is here. Jenny and I are no longer friends. And that's because she is dead. I'm an English major and I transferred to community college. Thank you so much for asking, by the way. And the last class that I took in community college was an American Literature 3 class. Now, we're a class of about 10 students, and we sat very close together. But I like this a lot. Because it really meant that like, you got to know about people, and you got to know what they liked, and you got to know their names, and I did. Except for this one girl. I messed up. One day, we're in class, and we're having a group discussion. And she says something that's very smart. She's like, ah, oh, I can use this, I can use this. So I'm like, Professor, I would like to speak. And he's like, yes, no, go ahead, speak. And so I say, Professor, I would love to build off of the point that and I didn't know her name, so I just came close. I'm like, hey, I'm so sorry, uh, I think I forgot your name. Uh, would you be able to remind me what your name is again? And she tells me what her name is, but this is the point in time at which we have to wear masks in class. So she tells me her name, but what I see and hear is this. <laughs> and instead of asking her, hey, what was your name again? I said, Professor, I would love to build off of the point that she said. <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> and uh, there's silence uh, filled the room. And uh, her friend sitting in front of her just kind of leans over and like, "Oh my gosh, did did, you, did he just blow off your name like that? Like, wow!" And I'm feeling terrible about this fact. And so a thought appears in my head, which is a thought that I often have, but it's never a good thought when I have it. That is, I refuse to let things end like this. I have to make things right. So, class is over, and I have some business with the professor. So I'm talking to the professor, talking to the professor, out of the periphery of my vision, I see her start to pack up her stuff and leave. So I'm like, talking to the professor, talking to the professor. She's out the classroom, I'm like, thank you so much, professor. And I start running after her. And I run out of the classroom like this. And at this point, she's already in center square, she's unchained her bicycle, kicked up the kickstand, and started to bike away. Now at this point, a normal person would just think, like, whatever, right? Like, it's fine. But what I thought was, it's Wednesday, I'm not gonna see her again until Monday, and by then it won't even matter anymore, and I'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for forgetting your name. She's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I, I, I messed up your name the other day. And she's like, you know, I completely forgot the fact that you did that. And that she brought it up, I remember again, and feeling bad. I think you're a terrible person. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need everyone to like me, so I need to apologize now. So I run faster at her. And I run at her, and she's biking away, and I reach out, and I stop her bike. <laughs> so, she has been biking 
I have been running, but everyone else in the class has just been walking, which means that when they hear the sound of rubber on asphalt, which is not unlike the sound of my soul being torn out of my body, <laughs> everyone swivels around to look at the idiot that just stopped a girl's bike. As I'm standing there in center square, everyone looking at me, I'm like, so this is where TV comes from. Well, like, stuff like this can actually happen, but I didn't have time to dwell on that fact, because she turns around all angry, but she's still wearing a mask, so it's just like... <laughs> hey. Look. I didn't mean to make it sound earlier, like... I was just missing your name, I... I just didn't know what you said. I'm sorry. She tears her mask off like this. Itself. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? I-T-Z-E-L. Itself. That is my name. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> so instead I said, perhaps the worst thing I could have said. And I tapped my forehead twice and went, I'll remember that. <laughs> and she biked away. My name is Noah Kim. Thank you so much. For Enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah,
that's me at the exact moment that I decided to drop Physics 7B. <laughs> season has lasted pretty much as long as the fall season. And even though my last midterm, everyone, was last week to the day, I feel like my body's still in midterm mode. I'm sure you all know how I feel, right? Like my heart's pounding out of its chest. My hairline is receding by the minute. And weirdly enough, my body keeps telling me I have to piss. You know? Like, like I don't have to, but I swear on every hour I just go in the bathroom and I'm minute passes, and nothing happens. Anyway, I think I know how I deal with it, though. Every week, I go to the grocery store, and I slap the watermelons. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Berkeley Bowl, 4 p.m. Fridays, that's me time. Uh, anyway, I always wondered, uh, I always wondered, do we actually know when watermelons are ripe, or do we just like hitting things, you know? Like, I'm sure we've all been there. We've all had a hankering for watermelon before. You go to the grocery store, you find the watermelons, it's not that hard, and then you spank them, and you listen. 
<laughs> and that's the hard part for me. Because if you hit a watermelon and it's ripe, it goes boom. If you hit a watermelon and it's not ripe, it goes boom. And that's the confusing part of it. It's so crazy. Like, and also, like, it's just unoptimized, too. There's always like a small army of watermelons there, and they're all like piled up in a crate. I swear to God, I'm in Berkeley Bowl, Friday, 4 p.m. Me time. And, and I'm like, oh, God, this is going to take an hour at least. I feel like the world would be a better place if it were easier to tell the difference between a ripe and unripe watermelon. Like you hit a watermelon, and if it's ripe, it goes... You hit a watermelon, and if it's not ripe, it goes like... No. <laughs> not me. <laughs> Next. I would love to live in that world. Uh, Alright, so a couple years ago my first job was at a hardware store, and uh, one of the most important things that I learned there was a little thing called the ratio. What is the ratio, you may ask? Well, good question. Uh, the ratio is the ratio of people who stop by a store just to shop, and people whose life mission it is to shop at that store. They need something at that store. See, for example, the ratio at a place like Sports Basement is low. No one ever bursts into Sports, base, into sports Basement uh, like, I need a sleeping bag! Like, dude, calm down, you're going to a sleepover, right? <laughs> like, just oh, calm down, go sleep on the couch. The ratio at a place like a hardware store is much higher. See, the hardware store is the only place on planet Earth where you can meet someone who has to paint their house by tomorrow, and you can meet someone who has to build their house by tomorrow. Like, it's crazy! Like, see, take for example, I work the phone, and it's the same every time. I swear to God, it's like we both have a script. I pick up the phone and go, this is a hardware store. And they go, hey, do you have hardware? And I go, hmm, yeah. And I hang up! <laughs> easy. Easy. This one time, though, pick up the phone. You know how it goes. This is a hardware store. And this guy, this guy goes, hey! <laughs> and I swear to God, immediately I'm shaking to my core. It's as if I picked up the phone, I didn't say anything, and he told me my social security. <laughs> like, I knew something was about to go down. What he says next is, Do you have sticky, 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 white waterproof tape? And I'm like, please hold. And I go to my coworker, Kieran, and I'm like, Hey man, do we have uh, sticky, 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 sticky? White waterproof tape and Kieran, you know, he's strung out as usual. Probably high, but who gives a shit, right? Like, it's Saturday, 1 p.m., who cares? It's his time. Uh, and Kieran, he goes, Do you mean plumber's tape? Do you mean plumber's tape? Yes! <laughs> I need some sticky, 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 sticky white wa waterproof plumber's tape. Do you have it? Please hold. <laughs> I've been working here for three days. Day three this happens. I go to Kieran and I'm like, hey, do we have plumber's tape in stock? And Kieran, class act all around, doesn't even move, doesn't even walk there. The, plum the plumbing section is on the other side of the store. He does that minimum wage lane. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. He's just kind of like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have been stuck. And what he says next, I will never forget for the rest of my life. Without skipping a beat, he goes, I'm already there, brother! And he hangs up! <laughs> for the next five minutes, everyone, I am terrified. I have no idea what I've wrought upon Glen Park hardware, but I'm afraid it's the Joker. <laughs> Five minutes later, the most milk toast, normal white guy comes into our store. I, like, I'm talking about, like, he doesn't even idolize the Joker. And he goes, show me the tape! <laughs> he immediately goes to the plumbing section, grabs six, six rolls of sticky, 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 you know the last part, white, waterproof, plumber's tape. And he runs out. Now this is where the story originally ends, until a year later. I'm telling this story to my cousin, almost verbatim, but a lot worse. Uh, and she goes, dude, of course, he's screaming, he needs plumber's tape. And I go, what do you mean? <laughs> you know 
what I mean. Everyone, this guy's toilet exploded! I swear to God, it's like Fight Club. I was the villain the entire time. I was like, please hold me. Well, shit was dripping down his walls. I was Tyler Durden. Anyway, let's talk about Canada. So, uh... <laughs> I went to Canada for the first time a few months ago. And, you know, it's a pretty cool place. Yeah, Canada! Uh, all right. Yeah, but we all know like the fun, good parts about Canada. You know, we've all heard our fair shares of like, oh yeah, some stories and everything, and poutine or whatever. You get the shit right. Oh uh, shit. Uh, one thing I just want to share, it's really special to me personally, is that, see, listen, I'm a San Francisco native, and in Canada, there's snow, and I think it snows there 365 days a year, but don't fact check that. And I swear to God, every day of my seven day trip, I would hand my phone to one of their kind, kind strangers. And I'd have them take a picture of me knee deep in snow, going, Burr. <laughs> But back to the topic, uh, we've heard too many good things about Canada. I think there's one very blatant flaw in the entire country of Canada, and it's getting there. I swear to God, every leg of my trip to and from Canada was riddled with, delay, with delays three, four, five, six, even seven hours long. Flights canceled about 20 minutes before they arrived? What a nightmare. I remember this one time I was in the Montreal airport, and, and my flight to San Francisco was canceled. 7 p.m., whatever. There's a later one, probably, right? I go to, uh, I go to a security guard, and just to paint a picture, everyone, imagine Quebecois Paul Blart. Right? So he's bald, he's a big bald head, and he's got a big bushy mustache, and he's like Canada fat, so he's like 200 pounds. Uh, and I go, hey man, uh, where the, uh, where, where can I rebook a flight to San Francisco? And he looks at me in the eyes, and he goes, America is closed. Like, what the fuck, man? It's not Denny's! Like, come on, no one turned, the lights aren't off in America. No one clocked out of America. And honestly, I'm fucking angry right now, and I'm not proud of this, but I open my hand and I slap him on the side of his bald ass head, and it goes. <laughs> <laughs> he looks at me, and he goes, uh huh. And he, <laughs> and he pulls out some handcuffs. He handcuffs me, and he puts me in a in a bus, and he deports me to America. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> particularly chivalrous gentleman, you can spritz him with a sugar water. <laughs> That's the weapon the feminist arsenal is missing. Sugar water aerosol. I've been trying to get better at feminism. 
Um, <laughs> it's a two-pronged approach. Uh, first of all, if I'm walking with a girl, I'll make sure to walk really slow. So if we come on a door, she has to open it for me. <laughs> the other thing I do is um, I've been trying to mansplain less. So if I come across a situation where I have the opportunity to mansplain, I'll pause and I'll think to myself, is this someone that I used to date? And if the answer to that is yes, I will plow right ahead. Because that way, it's not mansplaining, it's explaining. <laughs> so I'm trying to get better at that. Um, I think self-improvement has generally just been a recurring theme in my life. Uh, so I did a couple small things. I, I got into skincare recently. Uh, I exfoliate now, which is the only socially acceptable way to skin yourself alive. <laughs> Uh, the other thing I started doing is um, I'm trying to be more self-appreciative, and I gotta say, that's so I get it. <laughs> so I kind of ran out of steam on the whole self-improvement front there, so I thought I would try to work backwards from there. And so what I thought I would do is sit down and try to outline what I want my future biography to look like. So then I can kind of work backwards from there and I know what to work on today. Entirely useless exercise, only took me three minutes. First two minutes were me coming up with the title, uh, which ended up being holy shit. Spelled W-H-O-L-L-Y, <laughs> you know the rest. The remaining minute was me deciding I want my biography to be a workbook. Because if you think about it, a workbook is really the only form of publication where the reader writes more than the author. <laughs> uh, yeah, so from there, I realized communication is something I want to work on, so I thought I would learn a new language. I want you to understand, this is not because I'm interested in a new world view or learning about a new culture. I just enjoy the idea of being able to ignore someone in their own language. <laughs> so I went with Mandarin, because if I pull it off with this face, it's incredibly impressive, and if I screwed up with this face, it's incredibly funny, so win-win. <laughs> so I studied it for a couple weeks, and then I thought I'd give it a test drive. So it was the first week of classes, I believe. All the clubs were on Sproul, promoting in full force. So I went out there and I said something in Mandarin. I don't know what I said, but what I do know is I managed to get the Taiwanese Student Club and the Chinese Student Association to unite forces <laughs> to kick my ass the following Tuesday. <laughs> so back to English we went. Um, yeah, uh, one of the things I learned, by which I mean multiple, told, multiple people told me repeatedly, is that I'm too blunt when I talk. So I've been trying to fix that by speaking more pointedly. <laughs> the other big breakthrough was uh, I finally, finally worked past social anxiety. And um, so, just to give you a sense of what it was like while I was going through it, I just kind of be in a conversation, and I feel like dead weight, like I wasn't contributing much. And I just feel like I was generally weighing down the whole thing. Uh, analogies would probably help here. I felt kind of like a... Oh, this is embarrassing. Alright, I'm going to need a little help. I felt like a, a, what's the heavy metal thing that ships use so they don't float away? Anchor! anchor. A wanker, thank you, that's what it felt like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, turns out, the fix of social anxiety, at least for me, uh, I adopted another kind of anxiety, and then the social anxiety left on its own. So it turns out, it can't bear being around others. <laughs> yeah, so, so now that I talk to more people, I now realize how many people are weird about relationships. I realize all the people that are weird about relationships fit into two categories. So the first category is like the sad, simpy people who really have no other personality traits. A couple of those friends, like, they would only hit me up when they were down bad. Those are 100% of the conversations we would have. And I realize that sounds exhausting, but there is a silver lining because of those people. I stand here before you today as a certified thirst responder. <laughs> the other silver lining with those friends, I never had to think too hard about what to get them for gifts. Because anytime a special occasion rolled around, I'd just go out and buy them a board game. So every time they look at it, they're reminded of just how alone they are. <laughs> so that's one category. The other category is people that are a little too into their relationships. You know people that just unprompted will be like, my better half. Right? Those assholes? <laughs> Every time I hear that phrase, it pisses me off so much. I want to sit down whoever says that and just look them in the eye and be like, Look, you're worth more than that. Stop devaluing yourself. You're not worth half. In fact, I'm thinking of you as a-hole right now. <laughs> I ran into one of these people in the wild. So I was on the bar. Yeah, I was on the bar. Earth the educated among us call it the Bartholomew. 
<laughs> so I'm sitting there, this guy walks up to me, and he goes, excuse me, my phone just died. I need to text my girl, could I borrow your phone? And so I was like, yeah, as long as I don't have to hand you my phone, I'm down to help, however. So he gives me a number, he tells me to text her, hey, it's Key, my phone just died, meet me at Powell Station. So I send the text, he sits down next to me, I get back to listening to my podcast about podcasts, <laughs> and we're waiting, I get a text back, and it says, well, we always meet, baby, and it's got a kissing emoji, which is disgusting, he clearly said he was using a stranger's phone, what the fuck is wrong with it? <laughs> now, I refuse to read that out loud to him, like some kind of text cock. <laughs> so, uh, so I just tap him on the shoulder and I show him my screen, and he glances at it, he's just like, yeah, just say yes. And then five seconds later, he turns back and he says, also tell her I love her. And I feel like I'm in too deep to tap out at this point. <laughs> so I do it. Less than a minute later, she responds, I love you more. And at this point, I feel like I've served enough of a sentence for choosing to be a good Samaritan. So I just don't tell him about it. And then a minute later, he turns around and he's like, hey, did she say anything? And I looked him in the eye and I said, I'm so sorry, dude, my phone just died. <laughs> I'm lying, I'm lying, I'm lying. That's not what happened. What happened was, I didn't tell him about it. He turned around, asked me whether she said anything. I said no, she didn't say anything. And then I turned away and texted the number, unsubscribe. <laughs> you guys heard of DINK? All right, it's this acronym, D-I-N-K. Stands for Dual Income No Kids. It's this lifestyle shows people make, I guess. Uh, which is a very strong take to have no kids, especially considering this is a take I've only ever heard from people my age. Uh, I feel like there are two big upsides to having kids. One, you get the chance to be disappointed in someone besides yourself. <laughs> right? And the second upside, if you name the kid et al, that kid's going to be racking up citations in the jail. <laughs> To be honest, that last one was less of a joke and more of a litmus test to see how many nerds we have in this yeah. <laughs> Given how many laughs I've got, we've got one too many nerds that are out enjoying themselves on a Friday night. Thank you for being here, but also, you've betrayed your culture, you disgust me. <laughs> yeah, so ding. Uh, yeah, so I thought about it and I realized I'm not much of a ding person. I think I prefer wife absent, no kids. So in contrast to ding, it would be don't finish that thought. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a CS major and I forgot to give myself a software update, so now I'm kind of lagging. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm supposed to be talking about. It. Yeah, dink and wank. That was that was the joke there. In case anyone <laughs> yeah, I feel like we need more aggressively mediocre restaurants. All the restaurants we have right now are trying too hard to be good, right? They're aiming for the Michelin stars, the Yelp stars. We need bad restaurants. And I'll walk you through two scenarios to tell you why, and hopefully we'll all be on the same side of this issue by the end of this. So the first scenario where bad restaurants would help a ton are funerals. You can't have the food at a funeral be too good, because then that gets complicated emotionally, right? You walk past somebody sniffling, you think it's because somebody died, but it's really just because they ran out of appetizers, right? Somebody in the crowd is like, the meat is done to perfection. <laughs> the misinformation. <laughs> All I'm saying is, you can't have the eulogy be interrupted by somebody smacking their lips. You can't have that happen. So that's one scenario, it's funerals. The other scenario is first dates. It will never make sense to me why people choose to go to really fancy, highly rated restaurants for first dates. Because in my head, like, if you're trying to gauge compatibility with another person, you'd want to strip out as many confounding variables as possible, right? Like, people will walk into a Michelin star restaurant, and then they'll walk out being like, yeah, that was a pretty good date, that was a pretty good first date. And I'm like, was, was it really? Did you really enjoy the company of the other person, or did you enjoy dining five tax brackets above your usual? <laughs> like, if you walk into Chez Panisse, at best, you're walking out with noisy data. However, you walk into an Applebee's, you split one single small fries between the two of you, between the two, Jesus Christ. <laughs> if you walk out after that, and you think that was a good date, that other person is keeper, no doubt. Woo! <laughs> okay, I was kidding about the small fries, but I imagine that would actually set you back quite a bit, given how the economy is doing. Not that I know anything about how the economy is doing. I saw the word recession in headlines, and I was like, oh, most of that was the word recess, this should be fun. <laughs> 
Now here's what it hit when that the recession is actually an issue for me. It really hit home when I saw the recruiters were getting laid off. Because in my head, being a recruiter is one of the safest positions you could have. Right? You're the lifeblood of the company. If you if you're the CEO of a company that has no recruiters, let's say you need technical staff. Too bad, you can't get it. You don't have recruiters to go get them for you. You want to fix that issue by getting more recruiters? Too bad, you don't have recruiters to recruit more recruiters. You're done. The other reason it's super secure, one of the only jobs where you get to be the gatekeeper for your own competition. Like, imagine your recruiter and your boss is trying to replace you. Who's he going to ask to sift through the replacements? That's right, you. All right, at this point, are people tired of me yet? No. No. no! I've walked past mirrors before, so if you're saying yes, I'm right there with you. <laughs> okay, I started off talking about walking home, so I'll close with that and then confession. So, I was hanging out with a friend on the south side, and I live on the north side, so half an hour walk, and I made the brilliant decision to start walking home at 1.30 a.m. So I'm kind of shivering, mostly because of the cold. Two blocks in, I get a warning email. There's been a mugging two blocks from where I am. So now I'm trudging along with my backpack, shivering even harder. Not so much because of the cold now. I'm walking, praying I won't get mugged. At a certain point, I stop praying I won't get mugged, I just assume it's inevitable that I will. And then I start praying that whoever mugs me is a racist. Because <laughs> if you're a racist and you jump out to mug what turns out to be a Muslim with a backpack, who should be screaming louder than that? <laughs> All right. Cool, I'll close with a confession. I think we got a good thing going here. I'll, I'll be genuine for a bit. Um, Stand-up comedy is actually the last form of comedy that I wanted to do when I got on campus. So it started with satire, so I applied to the Free Peach, and they hated my application so much that they canceled my subscription. <laughs> and then I moved on to improv, tried to find a meeting schedule. Turns out all their meetings are improvised. Uh, and now I'm here, now I'm in front of you. And I don't want anyone to think that I hold stand-up in low regard or that I disrespect the art form. I actually, once I wrote out my set, I gave it to a friend so he could make sure it was actually funny. And I guess he noticed I was a little nervous. So he sat me down and he was like, hey man, you need to chill out. Just relax. You know, stop second-guessing yourself. Just silence your inner critic. And that's the kindest way I've ever been told to kill myself. <laughs> that's been great. Thank you so much. journal book. Um, it's a nice like red sequin notebook, very marvelous. And it was given to me by my good friend Gabriel Mitnick, who uh, unfortunately is uh, he's no longer with us. And by that I mean he's flaking by visiting his parents in the fucking peninsula. He couldn't even make it to my show. Unbelievable. So I'm going to use this to decide what we're going to talk about tonight. So let me see here. Okay, how about this one? This. Uh, so can you read this for me? Hiccups. That's right, hiccups. What else does it say? That's it. Oh, okay. That's probably not. <laughs> okay, so, you know when you get a case of the hiccups, you kind of go like, hic, hic. Hey. And you keep on going, you just keep on going. Well, the key word there is you. I am exempt from these mortal conditions. When I hiccup, I hiccup exactly once. I'm a one hiccup Harry. <laughs> and, you know, I can see this as like a superpower. Like, yes, I am a god among men. But I see it the other way around. I'm the normal person, and you all are defective. You all are freaks. It's like I'm living in hell. All these demons just running around going, hey, 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 
all over the place, the cacophony, the screaming, the noise. You know, just keep that shit to yourself. Is it that hard? Just stop hiccuping at me. And, like, worst of all, you guys don't even know how to stop. It's fucking crazy. Like, you know babies, right? Babies, they wear diapers. Why do they wear diapers? They can't control when they have to urinate, when they have to defecate, when they have to pee and poo. And just like that, you guys cannot fucking control yourselves. You guys are like babies. We need to invent diapers for your mouths. Oh, wait, we already did that. Um... So, yeah, like, okay, maybe you think I'm being really pessimistic, like, okay, Rohit, it's just hiccuping, like, calm down. No, it's a fucking cold. It's demonic. Think about it this way, right? How do you get rid of the hiccups? Okay, number one, you drink water, like, upside down. Okay, you know, I, I can see it. Number two, you hold your breath. Okay, those two seem kind of reasonable, like, it's respiratory, hiccups are respiratory, it makes sense. But number three, the number three most common hiccup remedy is getting scared. Like, what is this, Monsters, Inc.? Like, you have to extract the power of screams in order to heal yourself? Like, it makes no sense. It's fucking bullshit. This is why I think you guys are stupid. Like, you can stop anytime you want to. You're just too dumb. <laughs> but, you know, there's a silver lining here. And that is, with stupidity, with stupidity comes business opportunity. <laughs> So I have a proposal for you guys. Imagine you're going on a date. You know, you met this person online, you love their pictures, you know, great body, terrific smile, you text with them, they're a great texter, they have a degree, so you're gonna be financially stable for once in your life. <laughs> and, you know, you go on this date and you're so nervous, and you two are just slurping down your carbonara, and suddenly, you're a, you're <laughs> And they start the your date team starts guzzling down the water. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, I, I I had the hiccups. Like, is that an instant turn off or what? <laughs> like, date ruined, right? So let me introduce to you the first hiccup dating app. I call it Hookups for Hiccups. So on your hiccup dating app, you have your hiccup dating profile, and there there are tons of questions you can answer. Like, what pitch are your hiccups, high or low? Are your hiccups burpy, or are they flat? You can even, you can even record yourself hiccuping and have a little sound bite for people to play when they view your profile. Like, hic, hic, hic. Like, you know how, like, men, or some men, like, make their voice low to be, like, sexy? Like, imagine people doing this on this app, right? They, like, artificially make their voices lower to seem more sexy. You'd literally get catfished out here. So be careful, be careful. Um, but yeah, now reimagine your, your ideal date with the app, right? Again, perfect body, great whatever, blah, blah, blah. And great hiccups. <laughs> and you listen to them on the app, you're like, oh, I'm so nervous. My lip is quivering, you know, like I could, I could barely breathe. And, and as soon as you get to the date, as soon as you sit down, you, you ask them, oh, can you, can you show me? <laughs> can you show me what, your hiccups? And, and they're, they, they like blush and they're like, Oh, not here. Not, not in front of everybody. And so this kind of intimate relationship, this kind of intimate connection can only be found on my app. So I think I'm going to be a billionaire. I think I'm going to be filthy stinking rich off of you idiots. I'll still be lonely, because, you know, I can't use the app, but I'll be rich. And I swear to God, some of y'all actually need the help. Without me, you guys are doomed. <laughs> like, the other day, my friend asked me, hey, I really like this person, I want to ask them on a date. Where do we even go on a date? And I thought that was the stupidest question ever. <laughs> like, all, like, where you go on a date doesn't matter. All that matters is the other person, right? And so my go-to whenever people ask me this question, is Ikea. Anyone here been to Ikea? Yeah! yeah. yeah. The one down in Emeryville, magical place. And, you know, part of the magic that makes Ikea such a great date location is, you know, imagine you go to a restaurant, right? Um, and like, maybe you go to your Chez Panisse, maybe you go to your Gypsies, whatever, right? You gotta pay Berkeley prices for your food, and maybe you even have to cover the check of your date heat. 
That's so much money. But at Ikea, Swedish meatballs, uh, mixed greens, mashed potatoes, and lingonberry jam, all for the price of $4.99 with an Ikea card. <laughs> yes, there's an Ikea card. And it's actually one of the data centrals, right? You have cologne, breath mints, tissues for when she doesn't kiss you back, <laughs> and uh, of course the Ikea card. <laughs> and part of the magic of, of Ikea is not only, you know, the food, it's also, it's the only place where you can window shop without getting kicked out. Like, no one's gonna come at you like, ah, those damn kids, get out of my store. No, you can go to the showrooms and you can imagine your future life together. You can, you know, pretend cook in the, in the kitchen. You can read Stothelt Oak Odom in the study. And you can even, you know, take the beds for a spin. You know what I mean? Um, but I, I think it's kind of weird in that, like, you know, everything is, like, tailored around trying it out and demoing things, right? But there are a few things that are not like that. And I learned this a long, long time ago. So, back many years ago, uh, I was in Ikea, my very first time going to Ikea, and I said, I have to potty. So I was like, okay, let me go and, and find a potty. I find two white, you know, tiled walls, I see a sink, and I see a throne. And I sit down on the throne, do my business, I get up, I press the, I press the flusher, and I don't hear a flush. So I look back to investigate, and I'm like, whoa. Whoa! <laughs> this is sick! The poop is floating in midair. I was stunned. Just transfixed right there in midair. It didn't hit the bottom of the toilet. I was so confused. So I bend down. I go get a closer look. I'm like, oh, there's a little plastic clear thing that stops the poop from going all the way down. Isn't that crazy? And I get a tap on the shoulder. And man, was that the worst date ever. Like, holy shit, that was awkward. <laughs> it was my day T. She tapped me on the shoulder, and she just looked stunned. I don't know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. But being, you know, the brilliant stand-up comedian, one-time hiccupper that I am, I came up with an explanation pretty quickly. And, you know, it was like maybe 10 paragraphs long, you know, MLA citations, you know, the works. And I was about to say it, but all that came out with a single kick. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Alright, I have a cringe one line. Can we hick up some more laughter and applause for a moment? <laughs> October 29th at 2.37 a.m. in Berkeley. If you're unfamiliar, October 29th was Halloween weekend. Now, I'm from a suburban area, so moving to the city was a, was a, new, a new experience for me. I'm a transfer student as well. This is my first semester. I'm enthralled. I'm like, oh my god, people are out. It's 2.30 a.m. This is my time to shine. So I, I walk outside and I think, I'm just going to take a stroll, enjoy the costume, it's going to be fun. And then, this man emerges out of the darkness as soon as I lock my gate. And he says to me, honestly, the most effective pickup line I've ever heard from a 45-year-old man at 2.37 a.m. in a blazer. He goes to me, oh my god. I was scared that, I'm just glad it's a person. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> What has happened in this man's life? <laughs> How am 
many dark streets has he wandered at 2.37 a.m. in a college town as a 45-year-old man in a blazer where he had to say, oh my god, thank god, last time, you will not believe. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of have some notes for this man, because my thought is like, yo, like if my goal in life was to make women uncomfortable, I'd be a little bit better at it. <laughs> um, so I have some drafts for you guys, uh, if, you, if you ever need to, you know, it comes in handy, you know. Um, the first, I think, is a really good one, um, just to elaborate upon his idea, right? Um, this isn't the man. <laughs> Damn, shoddy! I thought it was a rabbit. Good to know it's just a beautiful, thick woman. <laughs> Here's another good one. From my, uh, my, uh, social scientist in the room. This is the man again. <laughs> Damn, girl. Something about you reminds me of my mother. <laughs> um, but uh, there's actually one that's even more terrifying to me. Um, that, God, if I heard, I might break down crying. And when you live in Berkeley, as a woman, you hear a lot of shit, alright? So this, this is, this is the one. <laughs> I really respect you, and I would like to take you out on a date. <laughs> Back the fuck up. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I said, I'm from a suburban area, um, so this whole city life is kind of new for me. Um, I'm from Orange County. Right. Right. <laughs> if you're unfamiliar, Orange County is in Southern California. It's in between Los Angeles and San Diego. Um, it is one of the few conservative parts of California, um, and we have a great reputation. Um, <laughs> I, if you're, if you're kind of curious about the vibe of Orange County, um, my first week here, I was in an evidence class, and uh, there was a statistic question, and I'm that kid, so I'm like, oh, I'll answer the question, everyone's going to see where I am. And so, the question was about, like, police records, and the professor was like, what's faulty with this? And I'm like, oh, you know, the police self-report, they can manipulate the information. And he kind of asked for, like, personal anecdotes, so I thought I would detail um, this horrendous mess that's going on with our district attorney in the Orange County Police Department. And so I said, back in Orange County, and I didn't even say anything else, a room full of 400 students went, oh. <laughs> I'm like, all right, so this is how it's going to be. <laughs> um, but yeah, Orange County is very suburban. Um, it is kind of iconic. We have a lot of attractions. I can break it down into percentages for you if you'd like. Um, ten percent, I would say, is that we have like really fun entertainment. So we have like Disneyland, Legoland, Knott's Berry Farm, like Hollywood's close by. We got a lot of that good stuff. Um, another ten percent, I would say, is kind of like the business professional side of things. We have UC Irvine. We have a lot of like company headquarters. Um, the other eighty percent, um, I would say, is our nation's sex trafficking rings. That's that's a real statistic. <laughs> Um, yeah, like, uh, we, we always have a lot of co in lot common, Orange County and Berkeley, like, you guys have a lot of traffic, we have a lot of trafficking. <laughs> Stay a while, and you may never come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, Orange County has a lot of shows about it, like, I don't frankly even need to make it entertaining for you, because it doesn't, it, we do it by ourselves. Um, if you're familiar with the OC, Arrested Development, Real Housewives of Orange County, Real Murders of Orange County, <laughs> airing every Sunday at 8 p.m., 7 p.m. Central. Yes, it's airing right now. <laughs> um, I, there's, just, there's just a lot going on. There's, there's a lot to love. Um, so it is funny to me when I tell people from Orange County, I usually do get that face like, I'm on a good one, I promise. <laughs> um, you know when else I have to say that? Um, what other place of origin you tell people that you're from, and then they go, and you have to say you're one of the good ones, which is a great thing to have to tell a person, by the way. Um, Germany. <laughs> so my mother's family immigrated from Germany. Um, and anytime someone inquires about my ancestry and I say, oh, like I'm half German, I get this response. Your ancestors in the war, were they... <laughs> and I gotta be honest and say like, yeah. No, no, they were not. 
Um, but thank you so much, Ev. That's, it's funny to me, like, I feel like Germans out of all the European countries kind of have the, the worst reputation. I don't know why. I don't know where that came from, that they can shit up when that's the air at this point. <laughs> um, but you, like, see two representations of Germans in media, which is either, like, ugh, villain and Nazi, or, like, oh, this naive, like, blonde chick with braids that eat schnitzels. Um, so if you guys ever find, like, a German character that's, uh, uh, not a villain, or one of the reasons I hate being a female person, just let me know. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, when we talk about where we're from, um, another interesting place uh, is, is states within the United States. Because um, if you're from, you're from Germany, people don't really want you to have like pride in your country. Um, but yet, as uh, members of the United States, we're all like totally chill with having like really great pride for our states. Uh, Texas obviously is up there. We know they're nationalist. California, we hate to admit it, but there is a lot of pride because we've got a lot going on here. New York, obviously iconic. Um, we can kind of think of those as like the big three. Um, Hawaii, if you want to count more recent stolen land. But um, <laughs> um, th th there's kind of like the, what, what's next? Like, who, who's really proud of themselves for no fucking reason? <laughs> Ohio. <laughs> you ever met someone from Ohio? <laughs> if you don't know, the answer is no, because you would know. <laughs> if you're familiar with European immigration patterns, um, Germans, uh, a lot of them immigrated to Ohio, so my mom's family uh, is settled in Ohio. Um, and real recognize, real Ohio recognize adjacently Ohioan, because you guys know that um, that preacher on Lower Sproul who always has shit to say. Always. He has a script, and he sticks to it. Right? Right. What would he possibly break it for? I don't know. Never. Except this one time. Imagine me. First month. New school. New city. Oh my god. This is crazy. I'm wearing a yellow sweatshirt that says Cedar Point. Okay? Cedar Point. If you don't know Ohio, you don't know what that means. Cedar Point is just an amusement park that's there. It's iconic within Ohio. They also own Knott's Berry Farm. No one knows that shit unless you're from Ohio. Okay? <laughs> This man, whom we all know by face, stops his set and goes, I fucking love Ohio! <laughs> I have not been that scared by a 45-year-old man since Friday, October 29th, 2009. <laughs> um, uh, roommates, roommates, am I right? I love my roommates. I love my roommates. Um, I could have the greatest hits, top ten watch mojo, but one I would like to mention in specific is the following. Okay, um, I'm going to take a poll real quick. Woo if, when pouring cereal, put the cereal in before the milk. Woo! Okay, woo if, when pouring cereal, you put the milk in before the cereal. Woo! Okay, so now I kind of want to see... On a side, if you put the milk in first, you'll say the word milk. If you put the cereal in first, you'll say the word cereal. Go. Cereal! <sighs> Some people said milk. That's embarrassing. <laughs> on a Friday night, you're like, yeah, I'll say the word milk. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me talk about my roommate who will do neither. Okay. Here's what happens. I'm sitting at the kitchen table. Doing my thing. She sits here, too. She has the bowl. Sin number one. Pours the milk first. But all right, it's nothing we haven't seen before. We've persevered, okay? The laws have been repealed. We can be at rest now. <laughs> um, but then she does the most horrific thing I've ever seen in my entire life. She takes the box. She doesn't pour it from the box. She doesn't put the cereal in a Tupperware cereal container and pours it from the Tupperware cereal container. She does the following. She clumps. She takes the clumps and she just... <laughs> I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> Baby girl, let's talk about this. I I haven't been that horrified since Friday or Friday or Tuesday. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, one thing I'd like to end with is um, I have, a, I have a very special friend visiting me, and I don't know if you guys are familiar, but there was a rally today for um, the GSI strike. Um, and I took him with me, and he'd never been to a protest before, and he also did not know we were protesting because he's from Chico, California, which is three hours north, and arguably we're in Oregon County. <laughs> but, um, so here's what happened. If you're familiar to have the acronym, yeah, 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 he had it in his hands, right? <laughs> if you're familiar to have the acronym COLO, which stands for Cost of Living Adjustment, their argument is like, we're not getting paid fairly according to the cost of living here. Um, so one of the chants goes, um, no COLA, no contract. Oh. No cola, no contract. Um, which, uh, you know, means if we don't have cola, we're not going to sign the contract. He interpreted that to mean 
uh, we don't want cola, we don't want culture. <laughs> so in a moment of silence, after, after being riled up, he goes, fuck cola! <laughs> the local newspaper just so they, they could fill up the pages. <laughs> and just to really give you a sense of the culture, this was the type of town where alcoholic was a valid response to the question, what are your career plans? <laughs> and if you've ever been to the Midwest, you will quickly realize why alcoholism is so popular. It's because there's really just not much else to do. Like for example, one time I was driving through the cornfields looking for a gas station, a restaurant, really just any sign of civilization. And after a while, I've been driving for a minute, so I decided to look down at my phone, check Google Maps, and I realized that I'd just accidentally driven through the entire state of Iowa. <laughs> so that's just what the cornfields are like, man. And the thing about the cornfields is, people from the fields, they really don't give a fuck. And they also have a very bad sense of humor. And when you combine those two, it's a problem. Um, and I learned this firsthand. I learned this firsthand because the town I'm from, this town that I've been talking about, was called Fuck Off. <laughs> Spelled P H U C O F. Pronounced Fuck Off. And I mean, dude, just in, in addition to just the general embarrassment of living in a town called Fuck Off, <laughs> this also negatively impacted my professional career. For example, during interviews, the employer would be like, so tell me, about my, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? What does your family do for a living? And I'd be like, fuck off, they're all alcoholics. <laughs> it, got, it got so bad after a point, I'd just say I'm homeless. You know, that's, in my opinion, that's less embarrassing. Uh, not quite as embarrassing as being banned from Centerville Community Park until 2050, but definitely up there on my uh, tier list of things. I've always found car stickers funny, like the bumper stickers on the back of cars and stuff. Because uh, I always wonder what the point of it is, you know? Like, we've all seen that sticker. Have you guys seen the sticker, Baby on Board? Have any of you guys seen that sticker on a car? I've always wondered, like, generally, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that information? <laughs> like, damn, bro, I was actually planning on T-boning you and your piece of shit family. <laughs> But now that I know there's a little fucking three-year-old shit pissing in the back seat, I'll wait till you guys change his diaper before I send you guys all to hell. <laughs> another, one, another one that I'm a huge fan of is the, the student driver. First of all, props. Props for coming out like that. Um, I was just bored knowing how to drive. It's pretty embarrassing that you couldn't, but props for coming out. Whenever I see a, a student driver sticker, uh, I like to uh, randomly speed up and slow down. <laughs> I like to drift in and out of the lanes. Sometimes, if I'm really feeling bold, I'll stick my phone out the window, just that they can see that I have no regard for their or my safety. <laughs> and I am willing to risk everything over a small ego battle. You know? Uh, sometimes I like to honk randomly and watch them panic, trying to figure out what they're doing wrong. <laughs> you, know, you, 
know, you said you're a student. You said you're a student. You're gonna learn today. <laughs> you're gonna learn what the real world is like. Bitch. <laughs> And I think that's exactly uh, the philosophy that I was raised with. You know, there's no handouts in the world, and you gotta learn eventually, so you might as well learn soon, you know? Uh, when I was a kid, I was friends with a lot of older uh, people, you know, and sometimes older people can be great mentors. And sometimes then they can be the assholes that I was friends with. So these guys would just tell me blatant misinformation, and just tell me the most absurd shit throughout my entire childhood. And I think it really affected my mental development and left lots of gaps uh, in my knowledge. For most of my life, I thought Timbuktu was a made-up place. And that includes right now. Like, do you guys really believe this shit? You guys seriously believe- have any of you even been to Timbuktu? You guys seriously believe this shit. I'm gonna keep it real with you. If I've ever heard a made-up name, it's Timbuktu. It just rhymes too much, it doesn't make sense. And that's why I like to think of myself as an indie conspiracy theorist. You guys have heard the big ones, Illuminati? That shit's boring, bro. Forget about it. Forget about it. I have a lot of indie theories. I can't tell you, though, because then they wouldn't be indie anymore. <laughs> so you guys will just have to go home and, like, think. Um, <laughs> that's, that's one of my biggest hobbies, actually. That's what I do in my free time. Um, but yeah, so whenever I meet a conspiracy theorist, I like to outdo them at their own game. You know, they'll be like, oh, Bush did 9-11. I'd be like, okay, okay. That's a real, that's a real convenient accusation. Because where were you September 11th? Where were you? Where were you September 11th? That's what I want to know. Who can vouch for you? You know? Um, so obviously, after firsthand experiencing the negative effects that uh, misinformation can have on the developing brain, you know, there was only one thing I could do which is continue the cycle by spreading misinformation to any unfortunate child who comes across my path. So one time this little kid wandered away from his parents. I walked up to the kid, I was like, yo, kid. Because that's, that's how you address kids. I was like, yo, kid, you know 9-11? <laughs> You know, this kid has been on Coco Melon since day one. His brain is fried. He thinks 9 and 11 is like fucking like Slurpee or some shit. Oh, he's Slurpee. Uh, so the kid is a bit confused. I decide to help him out a little bit. So I lean up real close. I go, boom. I wait a bit. Boom. <laughs> Runs off crying. Shit was hilarious. And uh, on an unrelated note, I'm now banned from Centerville Community Park <laughs> until 2015. Thank you so much. Let's hear it one more time for Prada. We have a couple more steps to go, we're almost done. But I just want to thank you guys so much for coming out. You know, there's other things you could have done if you had social life, so it means a lot that you were here. Um, it's always good to be hostile with the crowd. Um, I also want to thank our performers, they've uh, done a great job this semester. Like, they've consistently made our club funnier. Also, fuck Michael Drake! Yeah! Uh, our next performer is Sean! <laughs> I hope my study is going to work. <laughs> actually, actually, I'm in the police. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that. <laughs> like last week, my brother just called me, who is, who is in Taiwan right now. He said, Sean, I have good news and bad news for you. I said, he said, Mom is going to visit you. I said, wow, cool. So what is the good news? <laughs> she said, that's the good news for me. And the bad news is, that was disappeared by the Chinese government. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people, they were curious about the relationship between Taiwanese and Chinese. Actually, I have to say, we are very close. Like, TSA and CSA, they were sometimes like our student association. They would hold an uh, event together. 
But once there was a weird guy using a weird Mandarin to say stuff. You Chinese spread the COVID-19. Are you the one? Because <laughs> as Taiwanese, you don't think of yourself as a Chinese. And as Chinese, you don't think you spread the COVID. <laughs> of course! The creatives. That's the reason why my father was disappeared. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sean. I'm from Taiwan. How is everyone doing? Yeah. Actually, I don't care. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't care. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about like mental health. <laughs> <laughs> for me, for me, mental illness is just people's imagination. <laughs> people nowadays, they are exaggerating right now. Mm. Yeah, it's just people's imagination. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was my imagination. <laughs> you did a good job. So, <laughs> I know, you will always be there for me. <laughs> so I have done like a psychology assessment before. The first, top, first part of the assessment is like it's a clinical interview. Like the psychologist will try to ask a lot of questions to understand you. I still remember the first question he asked like, Mr. Ling, may I ask you a question? And I was like, <clears throat> Yes, and that is a question. <laughs> He's trying to rephrase that. He said, Mr. Ling, may I ask you another question? And I was like, mm. yes, and that is another question. <laughs> so we just keep doing that for like 20 minutes. So he can charge me more. <laughs> and like, and like uh, during the clinical interview, he want to understand your per interpersonal relationship. So he says that, hey, Mr. Ling, how are your parents? I say, Fuck out, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ling, can you describe your love relationship? I said, mm, okay, um, I pretty love my girlfriend. I can prove that. Every week, I would take her to Ikea and I spend like four ninety nine. dollars I can prove it. I set my password number as her birthday. And every month, I changed my password number. <laughs> I, live, I love him so much. Shoot, I forgot the next line. Shoot, I forgot the password. <laughs> I got another password. <laughs> this is a calculator. <laughs> Pretend I forgot the next line. Um, so like after the clinical interview, there was a questionnaire, lots asked lots of questions. I still remember some of them is related to religious. Like uh, this is a yes or no question. So first question is that I do you believe that Jesus is the only God? Do you believe that like Allah is the only God? Do you believe that Buddha is the only God? So all of these questions, I just marked yes. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So like after the yeah, yeah. After the like uh, questionnaire and like the like, clinical interview, like the psychologist says that recently I have to inform you that you are a very irritable person, and I say no, I'm not. <laughs> you shut up. <laughs> also, you shut up. <laughs> I'm a very well-behaved, respectful, a good person. Oh, that's just my imagination. <laughs> so like after all the clinical interview, all the questionnaire, all the tests. Like my uh, psychologist just give me the report and he says that Mr. Ling, I have a good news and a bad news for you. Right now your mental health status is not quite good. And I said, oh cool, so what is the bad news? <laughs> that is the bad news! Oh, since someone is irritable. <laughs> <laughs> so the good news is our clinic can provide like, the, uh, like a psychologist consulting for you. I said, only me have to do that? He said, yes. Or is there someone else you recommend they should do the clinical consulting? I said, my imagination. <laughs> fortune teller, fortune teller. Two days ago, I went to a fortune teller store. Like, uh, when I just opened the door, the fortune teller just said, you are going to lose a lot of money. And I said, why? She pointed at the board. The board said, charge for every question. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. Uh, how much? She said, $5 per question. So I tried to give her like $5. She said that it should be $10. I said, why? <laughs> she said, that's another $5. <laughs> okay, so I tried to use Apple Pay, 
but somehow I cannot unlock my phone. <laughs> she said, don't you remember your password? <laughs> and I said, um, I think I don't have to pay you anymore. <laughs> she said, why? <laughs> Wait, but you still owe me like $5, right? I said, that is your imagination. Thank you, my name is Sean. We have a bit of an unconventional performance up next, but let's hear it for Sean! Yeah. Um, we're going to be um, having a PowerPoint presentation uh, by our good friend Ben here. Um, so while he's preparing, let's just um, think about like our deepest, darkest fears in silence. Am I scary? Damn. Alright. I, I, I love you, RJ! I got something to do. Fuck. Um, I, have, I have a deepest, darkest secret, which I can't tell because there are people who went to my high school who are here. Um, uh, <laughs> this is why I did not perform today. Hi everyone. In Germany we say, uh, when someone doesn't get a joke, oh, you, you probably go to the basement to laugh. So I'm very happy to see you here all tonight. <laughs> Let's see how we do this. Okay, so hi, I'm Ben. I'm from Germany. I moved here uh, in February. And, and I have to tell you, I feel like I'm back in my uh, freshman year of high school. Because first of all, you guys play 2000s music everywhere. <laughs> and then second of all, I, I like all the social skills here. Um, no laughs, I think there are no X majors here tonight. Um, so, uh, for example, I, I meet someone new and they can say, Hi, how are you doing? And I go, to, Oh, thank you very much for this question. I got up at 7 a.m., I had a nice breakfast, I worked all morning, and I had potatoes for lunch. Um, and, but I'm a little bit sad because my grandma died last night. <laughs> and then there are two ways how how, what, how the situation plays out. Either they say, oh my god, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And then I usually am very confused and don't know what to do. Uh, or they just turn around and they say, oh, what a fucking weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, since I didn't uh, want to um, be that socially awkward anymore, I, I tried to solve this problem and I did so by, <laughs> of course, creating an Excel spreadsheet. Um, here's my Excel spreadsheet. On the left side it says American English. And on the right side, it, it explains the meaning. So, for example, um, hi, how are you doing? Means, um, hi, and it's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, for example, hey, let's have lunch sometime. <laughs> Means, um, I don't want to see you again. <laughs> Had to learn that the hard way. And, uh, a little bit rougher version of that is, uh, see you around, which means... <laughs> <laughs> I also had to learn uh, what best means. So I uh, went to the best play salad place in town and it was just A salad place. So yeah, best is just A. Um, <laughs> and a friend, um, that's just a person you met at least once. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in conclusion, your best friend is just a friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, now my favorite one is a little extra. So, when I first came here, I, I met a girl that I liked, and so I asked her best friend, Hey, uh, do you think I can date her? And she said, Oh yeah, you could do that. Um, but she's single, but she's a little extra. Three months later, I realized a little extra means batshit crazy. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, as, as you can see, um, by now I adjusted a little bit to American culture. I, I managed to unbutton my top. <laughs> um, and maybe I thought for tonight I, I'll explain you a little bit uh, how, how German culture is like. And uh, I will start out by telling you a German joke, so you can feel as awkward as I felt when I came here. <laughs> so, um, for that joke, you need some background knowledge. 
uh, about Germany. This is a German taxi. It's very expensive to ride uh, because it's a Mercedes. And <laughs> I saw a Mercedes. It has a little star in, in the front of the hood. You can you see the, the star up close. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. Woo! Okay. Let's let's draw the background on what you need. So, grandma, grandma is in Berlin. Wants to go to the other side of Berlin, and uh, she calls a cab, and she starts riding on the cab. It's a long ride, uh, and she gets a little bit bored. So she asks the cab driver, "Hey, what is this star in the hood for?" And the cab driver is also bored, so he thinks, okay, I can make a little joke. And he uh, goes like, well, the star, it's there for aiming at pedestrians who <laughs> cross the street. And coincidentally, there's a pedestrian crossing the street, so he starts aiming at the pedestrian. He <laughs> goes like full throttle, and in the last moment, he yanks the steering wheel around. Um, and then he looks in the back mirror. What does he see? The pedestrian is lying bleeding on the street. <laughs> and then the grandma says, If I wouldn't have opened the door, she would have missed him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, the Germ Germany is weird. Um, we, also have, we also have conspiracy theories, uh, like you Americans. The, the only difference is uh, even weirder than here. So, here you have 9 11 conspiracy theory, kind of makes sense. You can have questions about 9 11. What we have in Germany are sugar pills, like these. Uh, these sugar pills are supposed to help against itchy penis. <laughs> I'm not making that up. <laughs> uh, then um, another thing we believe in are un underground energy fields. They usually develop around underground um, water currents, uh, and they make everything above um, very hard to inhabit. You get like terrible headaches, other stuff like that. So, uh, the other day I got an email from Germany. From <laughs> I don't know who she is, I don't know where she writes me, but I found this in my mailbox. Um, so the email goes, Dear Mr. Barson, in our preparation for the barcode pricing, we noticed that there is no scanner at checkout once. Please ensure um, to install a scanner, check out one, and report back to me. Best wishes, Anke Wimos. So, a very professional uh, email, very formal from Germany. So, I thought, okay, good, um, I can reply very professionally. So, I go, Dear Miss Wimos, I regret to inform you that we did not install any scanner so far because of an unaligned energy field. <laughs> the field could severely damage the scanner and interfere with the barcode reading. Should we still attempt an installation? <laughs> Best wishes, Benjamin Barson. Um, so I didn't really expect an uh, answer, but it came very fast. Um, yes, please. <laughs> so I thought, okay, good. Uh, she really wants that scanner, so um, I'll follow up. Um, okay, will do. I will also contract a crystallogist to measure the energy field and install crystals to align it. And then because I'm a, a the German, I always follow through, I attach um, <laughs> this website, which has different kind of soil crystals, wholesale, um, and I also CC them. <laughs> and that's a recommendation. Okay, so at, at that point, it's, it's nice in Germany, I can't respect, expect any reply, and, but myself, I, I'm so jittery, like I'm waiting for this answer, I can't sleep all night. And, but sure enough, the next morning I get a response. Dear Mr. Barson, good morning and thank you very much for your email. Oh, she liked my email, I'm so happy. <laughs> um, this is the first time I hear about this. I'm very confused that the store manager didn't inform us. I highly doubt that there's an unlike energy field to check out one, since I check out two, about one half length away. Everything works just fine. Um, before you contract a crystallogist to measure the energy field, and install crystals, I want a cost estimate and an appointment application. Okay, so also she CC Team Viewer, cancel the recommendation. <laughs> yes, <sir>. um, <laughs> what can I do? I'm in so deep now. I have to have a doctor. Can't just chicken out. 
<laughs> so I will go clear with the emails. Uh, of course, I will provide a cost estimate before authorizing any subcontractor. I will also include a cost estimate for a spiritual healer to provide weekly <laughs> checkout balancing treatments for whoever works at checkout one. I'll be in touch soon. Thank you for passing. Okay, at, at this point, I think the three people in the CC uh, decided to notify her of, of this exchange, so I, all I got back was like missed email correspondence and please disregard. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>
<laughs> that is your time of humor. Seek help. <laughs> Let's, let's go back to the circle. Get it? Because tangentially means the line is tangential. And close down the comedic genius! <laughs> but yeah, you can never say this. You have to like keep it to yourself. As soon as you say you want to be a spy for a living, it's over. Uh, uh. Hello? Hello! Hey, it's me! It's, hey, Sophie, it's me. It's Johnny. Guess who I bumped into today? I bumped into Dave. Dave from elementary school. Remember him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the dude. That's the dude. That, he's the one that was that he always wanted to be a spy when he grew up. When, when the teacher asked for his name, he's like, the name's Schnitzel. <laughs> Dave Schnitzel. <laughs> Remember that one time Miss Chang asked us? to present on a personal hero, and that guy presented Leon Trotsky. <laughs> Who the fuck is Leon Trotsky? <laughs> oh, Leon Trotsky, he is Snowball from Animal Farm. <laughs> right, right, yeah, Snowball from Animal Farm, by George Orwell, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 of course I read that book. I love that book. It's my, my favorite, uh, dystopian novel. Dude, no, every, every night I read dystopedic novels. I was like, I haven't seen you in a fat minute. How you been? You know where this guy has been doing? This guy is doing a PhD in Russia in Leningrad school. <laughs> Leningrad, isn't that no longer a thing? Isn't that St. Petersburg now? No, 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 no. It's Leningrad school. <laughs> they only have two majors, political philosophy and philosophical politics. <laughs> he flipped the coin, he chose one of the two, I guess. You know why I bumped him? You can't believe this. Do you know why I bumped him? I bumped into him at a Russian restaurant. I saw him. I was like, what are you doing here, Dave? He's like, I, uh, I work here. I'm like, you work here? What, what do you do? He got like visibly nervous and shit. He's like, I, uh, I bake bread here. <laughs> I was like, you bake bread? at a Russian sit-down restaurant? And he got like visibly, I said, what are you trying to say, huh? What are you trying to say, you racist motherfucker? Are you saying that we don't eat bread? Is that what you're trying to say, huh? We don't eat bread, huh? I was like, whoa, 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 bro, calm down. You're half Italian and half Irish. Who is we? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Can we get a quick round of applause for all comics that play tonight?
Thank you all for coming tonight. Give up for yourselves. Yeah.